pretty much all of my PFAS presentations start with this one slide. Um, and, you know, this kind of takes us back to 2001 when, you know, these two monitoring um, studies really kind of blew up the, the issue of PFAS contamination. Um, and, you know, those were, um, you know, the work looking at PFAS and wildlife, not only from near contaminated sites, but, but you know, from remote regions like the Canadian Arctic. And of course, um, this one uh, from 3M, looking at the PFAS in uh, serum from uh, the United States. And this is non-occupationally exposed folks. So, you know, this is 2001, but here we are nearly 20 years later. Um, and the issue of PFAS is, you know, couldn't be bigger. Um, of course, there are different issues uh, now, but, you know, this is where it all started and started the question of, you know, um, where is PFAS detected? Uh, what are the sources for these contaminants and what is kind of the fate and transport of them uh, in the environment? Um, you know, moving forward, kind of getting uh, now to kind of um, closer to modern day, um, we now appreciate uh, that drinking water um, in some cases is fairly heavily contaminated, uh, but certainly above the uh, EPA guideline here set uh, for PFO and PFOS of 70 PPT, um, you, you know, this study from uh, 2016 and these headlines, you know, suggest that millions of people's, uh, people in the United States are um, exposed to drinking water that is above these guidelines. Uh, and of course, the question, uh, uh, you know, I always have as an environmental chemist is, okay, well, how did the water get contaminated, right? What is the source of this contamination? Um, if we understand that, you know, the water is a primary exposure source for us, uh, how did it get contaminated in the first place? Uh, which, of course, um, brings us to uh, you know the topic of today, and that is PFAS in soil. So, um, you know, this is not meant to be an extensive literature review by any stretch, um, but really, uh, we, we know that we can measure PFAS in uh, most soils from around the globe, um, not only from contaminated sites but, but remote sites. Um, which presumably uh, has become contaminated through atmospheric transport. Uh, we do know that there, there is kind of this, um, this nature where the larger chained uh, molecules tend to have uh, more absorption. Uh, and so the, the lower uh, one, chain molecules are not, um, do not have the same level of absorption. Um, but the important thing too is um, you know, kind of down here, this graphic kind of nicely shows it, um, is that, you know, once the PFAS get into the soil, in many cases, um, they are still uh, mobile, right? And so here the headline, PFAS chemicals are creeping through the soil to the groundwater. So this would suggest that uh, soils are not an ultimate sink of PFAS, uh, but actually, you know, they can then pass through and then uh, contaminate uh, other environmental media. So when we think of inputs of PFAS to the soil, again, this is not meant to be um, extensive, um, but you know, we think of things like biosolids amended soils, right? So taking uh, some of that um, treated sewage sludge and amending it to soils. Atmospheric deposition, of course, is an important one um, as well, you know, primarily for remote regions or maybe even the input of industrial waste. And so then we think about this, um, you know, what is the in kind of environmental fate of this? Um, there can be bioaccumulation from the soils into plants. Uh, that could be through our food crops or even forage crops, then that, which would eventually get into uh, humans and other animals as well. Uh, and then, of course, the one, you know, from this uh, graphic down below, the fact that, um, you, you, you know, a lot of PFAS just, they don't stay uh, still in the, in the soil. that They can be then transported. So um, if I have a kind of a little graphic of fate and transport focused around soil, right, we get various inputs from a, a biosolids or, or uh, from the atmospheric transport. And then we can have movement into different environmental uh, media, you know, crops, you know, um, getting into to forage animals and eventually us, or then into the groundwater and surface water and, and, you know, and then that could uh, eventually move into us. So all of this really is to demonstrate uh, that we need to have a really good handle as to what the concentrations are um, in PFAS and of course which uh, types of PFAS compounds are there. 
Um, and, and so because of that, we need um, really robust, reproducible um, soil extraction and analysis methods um, to understand the fate and transport of PFAS and then ultimately what the exposure is to uh, humans and wildlife. And so that's why I was really excited um, you, you know, for, for the EDGE uh, automated procedure to give us that level um, of reproducibility and, and robustness for the method that Alicia will, will talk about um, in great depth in the uh, second um, portion. Okay, so uh, I, I wanna touch on a little bit about the um, uh, PFAS applications at SIAX. Um, you know, we here at SIAX uh, have been uh, working with PFAS for a long time in many different uh, application uh, environments. So I just wanna kind of touch on a little bit um, before I get into uh, an explanation or description of the, um, the instrument that was used for the analysis. So, um, you know, PFAS in water has been a really big focus of regulators uh, and, as, you know, many labs. Um, and so we've developed some interesting methods looking at both a solid phase extraction approach as well as a large volume injection approach, um, including, um, you know, for more details, I would refer you to these, um, these uh, technical notes here that are available. Um, this one covers both the large volume injection uh, and the solid phase extraction approach. Um, there's other work that we have that has been focused uh, more towards meeting some of these um, EPA uh, regulation guide uh, methods. Um, but you know, uh, just kind of a, a summary of, of some of the applications. The SPE method is, is a well-used method, uh, both for DOD and EPA type of work. Um, you know, essentially, the, the process is taking a larger volume of water, uh, concentrating it on a, a SPE uh, cartridge, and then uh, eluding that so you have an effective concentration step. Um, the great thing about this is that you can achieve very low levels. Uh, this is a chromatogram showing uh, 10 uh, picograms on column. Uh, in this case, uh, this is on a, a 5500 uh, Q-trap instrument. You know, lots of sensitivity um, that we can see. Um, and, you, you know, here's kind of a, the calibration range, you know, taking down to, um, in this in vial of 25 uh, PPT, um, you know, with, with excellent sensitivity. Um, the point of using uh, you know, the SPE is that, you know, you can get just really exceedingly low in sample detection limits. Uh, so this being with a 500 times concentration factor, you know, able to see in the sample uh, as low as 0.025 uh, PPT or nanograms per liter. Um, so I'll kind of remind you that the EPA guidelines are 70 PPT, right? We can get um, significantly below that uh, using a concentration step. Um, and just kind of to show you that what it would look like in a real uh, world water sample, um, you know, again, hitting levels that are far below what would be needed. Um, another thing is, you know, um, with the, with the uh, sensitivity of instruments like the 5500 Q-trap, we can take advantage of, of, of that sensitivity to do uh, direct injections of water, in this case, uh, almost a mill and concentrate that on the head of the analytical column. Um, this isn't in, um, you know, like a, a true online SPE system, but this is really concentrating this um, large volume onto the head of, uh, of the analytical column. Um, you, know, and, and, you know, these methods have great robustness over long periods of time for analysis. Uh, and again, you know, this is a real world example, you know, showing um, levels even, you know, down to 12 PPT in a, in a groundwater sample. Um, accurate mass applications, um, you know, some very interesting applications in terms of um, using accurate mass, both a targeted and non-targeted acquisition, um, using something like the X500R Q-trap, um, sorry, X500R QTOF, and uh, we can use it in a targeted approach uh, with a uh, but um, with an MRM sort of technique, but using 
a high resolution fragment, uh, which means more specificity. Um, more specificity can be important in dirty matrices like soils um, to help reduce the background, right? And so um, this is an example for some uh, work uh, that we did in collaboration uh, with UNC Wilmington, um, looking at uh, Gen X in the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, this is a targeted um, method and so uh, this is Gen X itself, um, but we've also monitored some of the other um, polyfluoroethers. Um, looking at, you know, you, we can measure this uh, in sediment and, and, and river water um, quite readily. Uh, and this is kind of one of the, the shorter um, perfluorinated um, ethers. Again, you know, these are uh, real world samples for sediment and, and river water. Uh, the other thing that we can do is we can take advantage of a, a QTOF approach to do some non-target acquisition uh, using techniques like SWATH. Um, this is the, uh, the same samples. This is actually the, the sediment sample specifically. Um, and we can look at something which you know, has been identified um, by folks like Mark Streiner and his group uh, to be a, this diprotic compound. And the cool thing is we can obtain the MSMS fragmentation and we can look at some of these characteristic fragments um, to help confirm the identity of that uh, compound. And here I just have listed some of those characteristic fragments and what they represent uh, in terms of um, the SO3 group or the uh, CF3 group or uh, CO2 neutral laws. And this is kind of one of the known compounds, the uh, NV Haas here uh, with these uh, characteristic fragments. Um, so we can use the MSMS fragmentation pattern for compound confirmation if we don't have an authentic standard. Um, and then uh, if they are in an MSMS library, um, like our, our PFAS uh, version two library, then we can take something like an AFFF impacted groundwater um, and we can use the MSMS to do a library match uh, to either identify legacy compounds such as the 6,2 fluorotel sulfonate or one of these novel AFFF derived compounds. Again, using the advantage of the library. So that's just kind of a, a quick overview of some of the additional um, uh, applications, uh, PFAS related applications, and um, you know, before we get into more details uh, with the edge soil uh, extractor. Or, um, but I'll, I'll give you just a, a couple of um, background slides on the instrument. Um, that uh, I use primarily the, the 5500, um, in this case, 5500 plus Q-trap ready instrument. Um, and just, you know, some, some key criteria. Uh, the source is very robust, um, which is important for dirty matrices, uh, such as soils and sediments. Um, it has a fast polarity switching, uh, not as important for this kind of regular um, PFAS uh, acquisition, but does become important if you start to uh, measure some of the novel AFFF derived compounds, uh, which may, may be positively charged. Um, and then, you know, with the detector allowing for uh, a wide range of linear dynamic range. Um, just, you know, a, again, a couple of features that are um, interesting about it and, you know, really the key to have, um, you know, a faster detector, which allows you the polarity switching and then you know, an improved ion guide um, to transmit those ions. Uh, again, you know, talked about robustness and the importance of the source design. Um, this allows us to crank through um, samples on a continuous basis without having to um, you know, shut down the instrument for, for extensive cleaning. So built for robustness, simple to use. Um, and then, um, you know, the, the detector and uh, the Q-trap, um, you know, Q-trap can be used for doing um, some more confirmation work or um, if you do have a high background for trying to reduce that background. Okay, and again, the polarity switching, um, in this method, the you know, the fast polarity switching isn't as important because everything was done in negative mode, however, um, you know, once you start to move to monitoring some of those novel AFFF compounds, which would be ESI positive mode, 
then you in fact um, can benefit from that faster polarity switch to reduce your uh, cycle time. And then linear dynamic range, of course, um, you know, having a longer extent um, um, linear dynamic range can be very useful uh, when you're trying to measure everything kind of from a like a very, very clean, you know, sub PPT sample all the way up to something that might be in the PPM range, which, you know, a very hot sample. Um, so and that just kind of shows it here, the, the advantage with the 5500 plus that we can get that longer linear dynamic range. All right, and then uh, finally, the, uh, the newer QJet, um, which has improved ion transmission, um, which, you know, ultimately um, can help with sensitivity. Okay, and then uh, sort of one of the final slides, of course, is robustness. Um, you know, system tests were done with uh, a tea extract and, and various pesticides. Um, you know, over 2,000 injections um, with this, you know, hitting the instrument constantly. And you can see very good robustness and very good uh, reproducibility which again is important when you're running uh, dirty matrix samples. All right, so that's all I had in terms of an introduction to PFAS and some of the applications and technology. Uh, at this time, I wanna uh, pass it over to my co-presenter, Alicia, who's gonna get into more details uh, about the edge. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And Alicia, while you're sharing your screen, I just want to remind the, um, the panel of the attendees that you can type your questions in. And Craig, one question did come in. Uh, what is the name of the robust source that you use? Uh, in this case, this, this would be the Turbo V source. Thank you. All right, Alicia, we see your screen and you are up. Hey, thank you, Paul. And thank you, Craig. Um, definitely, I learned a lot just in that presentation alone. Um, and so hopefully now I can give some details on the um, sample prep extraction side of things. Um, and overall, definitely thank you to SIAX for giving me this opportunity here today. I think we have a unique situation where um, CEM and SIAX can come together and offer a full solution for the extraction of soil um, and for PFAS analysis. Um, so working for CEM and for a sample prep company leaves me in a unique situation in the fact that, um, you know, what I care about is the sample prep. And I don't know about everybody in attendance here, but I know for me when in the current world and I'm attending these virtual conferences, um, I'm watching a presentation and I am just begging for them to be a slide on sample preparation. Um, there's a lot of great stuff that out there on analysis and I get it because analysis is so um, interesting and so much has been done in that world. Um, but often, you know, the sample prep side of things is kind of glazed over. Um, but it is so very important um, because if you don't do correct sample preparation, you're not going to get good results. Um, so while this is kind of the topic that kind of doesn't get a lot of um, interest sometimes, it truly is very important. So I'm going to give you a lot of details on how um, we are going to prep and extract these soil samples. So Craig already gave us an introduction there we go, sorry. Um, Craig already gave us an introduction into um, PFAS and, and why we care about the soil and so forth. So I'm gonna jump right into sample preparation. And um, what I got depicted here is a very um, generic method of how we would typically extract soil samples for PFAS um, currently, right now. Um, now there are no EPA released methods for um, soil extraction or solid matrices at this time. Um, so different labs may be doing something just slightly different, um, but overall I feel that they're probably the majority are falling into um, what is depicted here. Um, so basically it's a very manual method. You um, weigh your sample into your tube, you add solvent, um, you shake, you typically do that for about um, 30 minutes, you sonicate for another 30 minutes, you centrifuge for about five minutes, you do an SBE cleanup, and then you go to analysis. Um, so it, again, it's a very manual method. Um, it takes a lot of time um, and it is, you know, just tedious. Um, and, you know, we kind of look at all the um, 
advances is made in an, an analysis and there really just is a need to bring sample preparation to the modern world to bring automation to the table um, and that's what we're going to offer here with the edge system um, so now i have the kind of flow chart for the edge system shown here and what you can see is clearly there's a lot less steps um, you're going to prepare your q cup which is our sample holder weigh in your sample drop it in the edge the edge is going to do everything else from that point on um, confirm volume and then go direct to analysis. Um, so really, you know, what we're doing is minimizing the steps, taking away the manual aspect, bringing automation to the table. Now, if we look at the two side by side, obviously, you know, there's a lot less steps going on, but I do want to just hone in a little bit on that SBE cleanup, um, because as you note, it's not shown there on the um, flowchart for the edge system. Now, for any data that I am presenting in this presentation here today, we did not do any cleanup. Um, so I think that's encouraging um, that for some samples, um, you may not need to have to do cleanup. However, I recognize for some really dirty samples, some different matrices, cleanup may be necessary. And so I do want to note that on the edge, you've got options there. Um, you can either do in-cell cleanup, so you can do cleanup, um, put the cleanup material within with the sample in the cell and everything happens at the same time, um, and or you could run SP cleanup post extraction. Um, so it just gives you some flexibility um, for that particular cleanup step. So I'm a very visual person, and so I want you guys to understand what the edge is and how it's run. So I've got a video here where we're going to walk through the process of the edge. So you see Brittany grab a filter there, our Q-disc, that's going to enable the filtration of our sample. And then you um, just screw on the bottom of that Q cup. It is very light. You can put it directly on an analytical balance um, and weigh your sample directly in. Um, you would then load your Q cup, your sample holder, into the rack, as well as um, something to collect your extract. Um, depicted here are glass vials. However, for the PFAS application, um, we would use centrifuge tubes. Um, so once you've got your rack loaded, you load your method, and then the edge is going to take over from there. The edge is going to grab that Q cup and it's going to load it back into the chamber. That's where the extraction will take place. It does run in series. The rack holds 12 samples. So you can run 12 samples in series. Then now what you're seeing here is a cross section of the what's going on in that cell. So we can add solvent from both the bottom and the top. You wanna to fully wet the sample. Um, this is a fully sealed pressurized environment that we're in now. We then start to heat. Um, in your method, you control your temperature of how hot you get. You don't have to heat. That is an option, not a requirement. And, um, and then once you reach your temperature and our hold time, your extraction is complete at that point. You're going to drain that sample then through our filtration disk, our Q-disk, through a cooling coil and collect that in your centrifuge tube. On the edge, you also have an option of what we call a rinse. So you can put clean solvent in, drain that through and collect that. Um, we did not use a rinse for the PFAS methods. You'll see when we um, go through the details of that. However, it is an option. Once you have collected everything, your extract is ready to go. However, as I noted, we run in series here. So we need to be very cognitive carryover, especially for um, PFAS applications where there's a lot of potential contamination points. So we are going to wash the entire fluidic pathway to ensure that there is no carryover. And that's what you're seeing the system do there. It's remove that Q cup from the chamber, and then it's going to go over to our waste port, and it's gonna wash that entire fluidic pathway um, to ensure no carryover. Once it has completed its wash, it's gonna either be done or move on to the next sample. Um, one of the great things about the edge is you have immediate access to your um, extracted sample as well as your extract. And for me, one of those feel good things is what Brittany is showing here is that that extracted sample is bone dry. It just makes you feel good that you've collected everything and then you have your extract, which is filtered and ready to go for to analysis. So hopefully that gave you a good visual of what the edge does, how it works. Um, and so now let's get into the details of what it's bringing to the table here for the extraction of PFAS. Um, and really, you know, I don't have tons of bullet points because it's all in the automation. Um, it really, that's what we're bringing to the table. We're automating what is now a very manual process. Um, by offering automation, we are making this process faster, more efficient, and um, also giving the ability of traceability, which is really important 
when um, you are doing things like sample prep, because historically we can't, it's not, can't have too much traceability there. Um, but in a regulated world, that's really important. Um, so you gain all of that. We've removed the um, human um, error from this. So you're getting um, greater efficiency. Um, and just overall, no transfer of that sample at all is occurring. Um, and so you just get, like I said, a very rapid, simple, and efficient method um, that's occurring um, in, in, in a modern situation. Um, like I said, there's, there's a need to kind of modernize um, sample, the world of sample preparation. Um, and I think the edge definitely um, fits the bill there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the details of PFAS um, because it's important to not introduce PFAS during the process. Okay, um, some of our standard uh, materials such as Teflon that we would typically use in our instruments are not compatible for the PFAS application because we may be extracting um, some of them from the actual materials in our instrument and we certainly don't want to be doing that. So we are going to ensure um, that our tubing is all either peak or polypropylene um, on the edge. Um, we also have the option of a side enclosure. This just makes sure that everything is, is in a closed environment um, so that it is nice and clean. Um, we're going to collect in centrifuge tubes. We also have a nitrogen option so that you can run in an inert environment. And we're going to verify that every um, consumable, um, so basically anything that has any contact with the sample, is indeed PFAS free. So let me dig in just a little bit deeper on that because it's important, right? Um, these are some of the details that are often glossed over and they're so very important to good data in the end. Um, so we have tested anything that the um, sample comes in contact with. So the Q-disc, our filter, um, the packaging of that, um, our Q-cup or sample holder, um, the centrifuge tubes themselves, the extraction solvent, um, pipette tips, the tubing, and, and just obviously an edge blank. Um, so we've run all of this to verify indeed at no point during the process is PFAS um, introduced at all. Now, um, if you want more details on this, we do have an application note that talks you through the entire study that we did. So please go to our website and um, you can read the details um, there. So now I wanna talk you through how we prepared our samples. And again, I hope you see this is simple, right? Simplicity is a big um, deal here. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build our, our Q cup and we're gonna put in our um, Q disc, which, um, is in this case our S1. What our S1 is, is a glass fiber filter that filters down to 0.3 microns. And um, it has a cellulose support so that it holds up to really nasty samples, um, kind of anything that we could throw at it. Um, once you put in your Q-disc, we then weigh in our five grams of sample. Um, in the case here, um, we are using a clean sandy loam um, purchased from Sigma Aldrich soil sample. So five grams of that would be weighed in. Um, and then we'd um, spike our sample for the spiking studies. Now, um, the data that I'll be presenting here today, um, the first two, the, the low spike and the mid spike data, um, we used an absolute standards um, um, reference material. And then um, for the high spike, we used, we switched over to Wellington standards. Um, so just wanted to let you know kind of what standards we are used for that. Um, we'll cover the concentrations when I go over on the, um, the actual data of the different spikes. So now for the edge method, um, these um, screenshots are taken directly from the edge itself. So this is exactly the interface that you would see if you were running the edge. Um, again, I hope you see that it's you know, quite simple. Um, while it's simple and very user friendly, you have a lot of flexibility too on what you can program in. Um, at first, you just wanna give a project name. Again, you choose your Q-disc, which is S1 in this case. And for the collection, what combined means is simply um, in the case here where we have two cycles, we are going to collect both of those cycles in the same um, collection tube, so in the same centrifuge tube. Now we go on to our cycles. We're going to do, like I said, two cycles. They are both the same for this. Um, and each of those parameters you can click in and change if you wanted to add those parameters. It may be difficult to see the details here. So if you click on the edit button up on the top, um, you can then see the details of the cycle. So the solvent we're using is 80-20 methanol water with 0.3% sodium hy uh, ammonium hydroxide. And we are going to add 10 mils of that solvent. And then we are going to heat to 65 degrees C. And then we're going to hold for four minutes at that temperature. And then we're going to drain and repeat that same thing 
for a second time. Um, so the total process of the method is just around um, 10 minutes with all of the extra washing and so forth. Um, so within 10 minutes, you have a sample that you can be moving on to analysis. Now our washing parameters are extremely important um, because we want to be cognitive of the fact that we are running in series and we don't want any carryover. So for this study, where we're gonna do a very high spike. We really wanted to make sure we used a very robust and aggressive washing method. Um, what I wanna note with the washing method is you have so much flexibility. Um, you can use different solvents. You can plumb up to six different solvents on the edge, different volumes. You can hold at different temperatures. Um, really have tons of flexibility to ensure that no matter what you're running, no matter how dirty that sample is, we can make sure that there's no carryover um, to the next extraction. So before you go to analysis, if you want to do good quantitative data, you do want to confirm your volume. Possibly there could have been some loss during that process um, and you want to make sure you're at that 20 mils. Um, so you're going to dilute to make sure that you are indeed at um, a known volume. And then in this case, we did neutralize with 20 microliters of formic acid. Um, and then, like I said, it's filtered and ready to go. So then that was taken direct to the um, analysis. And here I need to thank Craig for providing the um, instrument details as well as the chromatograms that you will see. Um, and my expertise is the sample preparation, um, not the analysis. So if you have any questions um, regarding this, definitely um, reach out to Craig on that. Um, and he can, I'm sure, cover any questions you may have here. So again, big thank you um, for him for providing this information. He already gave you the details on the instrument that was used for the analysis that we're talking about here. And if we look at the chromatograms, um, we overall see that um, we've got good chromatography. Um, note that well, this was run at two nanograms per mil. However, the instrument is much more sensitive than that. We just wanted to be in a good range for the range which we had spiked at. Um, so um, we certainly could go more sensitive. This was just relevant for the concentration range that we were looking at for the data presented here. Um, the hump for the um, PFBA peak there is um, just from the delay column, it's instrument leaching, so that's not to be concerned, and it is um, separated um, from the main peak, so we are still able to quantify the uh, PFBA. If we look in a little bit detailed here, you see that same thing going on with the PFBA, but overall, really great peak shape, um, good chromatography across the board for the PFAS that we were analyzing. So let's look at the, oh, well, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, and, you know, I like my extract pictures. Um, so anyways, um, I do like to kind of show pictures throughout the cross board because I think the visual kind of maybe sticks with someone maybe more than me just talking. So um, what you have here is the soil sample, right? So not a lot going on, it's just soil. It's a clean soil at that. Um, and on the left, you have pre-extraction and on the right you have post-extraction and, and no real transformation occurs here. Um, we wouldn't expect there to be. Um, if anything, it's clumped up a little bit because you're draining through that. You're pulling a lot of pressure on it to do the extraction. Um, and in the center, you have our extract, which is filtered and ready to go. You do note that there is some color there because um, we're not doing any cleanup here at all. So we're just extracting everything. Um, so you, indeed you would expect to see um, some color in the extract itself. So now let's look at the data. Uh, so this is the low spike, which is at 0 0.1 ppb. Um, and just another note, when I talked about the different um, reference standards that we used, the low spike and the mid spike um, was from a previous study that we did where we had um, spiked with the absolute standards reference, as well as we had outsourced the data to PACE Analytical. Um, however, PACE was using a SIEX instrumentation. So this was still done on a SIEX mass spec. Um, and across the board for the low spike here, we get acceptable recoveries and RSDs. Um, in general, we want to be between 50 and 120% recovery and less than 20% RSD. And we are well within that range for the low spike, um, which is obviously what we wanted to see. Um, I've split up the analytes that we've looked at into two slides, just so you can see them, so you can read them a little bit more visual. Um, so here's the first set of PFAS in the standard and then the second set. 
is now depicted here. And across the board for the low spike, as I mentioned, good recoveries, um, good RSD values, which is what we wanted. Um, so then we moved on to mid spike data. This was at 10 PPB. And um, that again, we had good recoveries and good RSD values across the board. And the same is true for those second set of analytes, which in the second set of analytes, um, you see both the um, PFOA and the PFOS, which are kind of the two that um, get the most attention. Um, and overall, we are seeing good recoveries and good RSD values. Now, as we move into the high spike, which in this case was 20 PPB, um, this is the um, data now that, that Craig did um, specifically, and then we switched over to the Wellington standards, um, but the same story, right? Um, we're seeing good recoveries and RSD values across the board. But once we get to this high spike, we really want to be cognitive of make sure there's no carryover. Um, so really for these particular um, data set, we were interested just as much in our blanks as we were in actual recovery values. If we go on to the second set of data, same story, right? So across the board, low, middle, high spike, we got good recoveries and good RSD values um, for the extraction of these PFAS in soil. So if we dig in a little bit deeper on the carryover, so now we see the um, or lack of carryover, um, we see the chromatograms of um, the blanks. Um, and you know, from this representation, um, it's kind of hard to see, okay, is that baseline or not? Is there something there? Um, so um, Craig put together a nice slide here where he compared um, the standard at two nanograms per mil with the high spike and then the blank. Um, and then that really gives you a nice visual that um, carryover is neg negligible, um, not really seeing anything um, there, which is good um, because we did a very aggressive wash. And so we would um, hope that we were not seeing any sort of carryover at all. Um, so at this point, um, you know, we had a nice study of a uh, spiking study for the soil samples. But I think in any case, you always want to have a CRM sample as well to kind of be more real world sample to see that we got good recoveries for that as well. So we did run an um, ERA um, CRM that is available um, and looked for the different components in that as well. Now, um, if you look at the data here overall, still acceptable, right? Recoveries are good. Um, RSD values are a little bit higher than I'd like to see um, within the acceptable range, but overall, I think we've got some room improvement here. Um, and so, in, and in our, we only did two replicates for the data that's presented here as well. So um, certainly, um, I think there's some opportunity for continuing the study and um, exploring not only some other soil serums, but also some other, um, there's some other NIST serums. I think there's a tissue serum out there with PFAS. Just kind of look at the different solid matrices that are available out there um, as you know, all should be applicable to the edge, um, which really gives it flexibility for the amount of different samples that we can run um, in this world of PFAS as it's going to continue to grow. Um, and, you know, Craig showed that nice little graph of kind of all the different areas where the PFAS could be. So it's going to go beyond just soil. Um, PFAS are really everywhere. And um, there's a lot of interest in really understanding this. And it's an emerging topic that will continue to grow. Um, Craig also gave the chromatograms for the um, PFAS we're looking here. So across the board, right, good chromatography. Um, so we're seeing really nice signal and um, everything for everything that we're looking for. So with that, you know, it's a pretty simple conclusion. I hope you've seen that the EDGE offers a rapid, simple, and efficient extraction method for soil, um, PFAS from soil. Um, you know, and it takes what you saw at that very beginning, that very manual process, and um, makes it um, a very modern process that is um, automated and um, gets all these other benefits um, for you as well. So that's going to conclude my portion of this talk. Um, so we'll open it up for questions and answers. And again, a huge thank you to SIAX for giving me this opportunity. Alicia, I'd like to thank you also for uh, taking time to uh, put that excellent presentation together. And I'd like to thank uh, Craig and you both uh, for really some excellent uh, information. And we do have a few questions. So let me start with the first one. Uh, it was reported that uh, there have been a uh, high propensity for false positive uh, data and that because of that labs are, have been doing PFAS have been doing 50 to 60 percent rerun rates. Can you two talk about any information you have about that? Um, 
Yeah. Craig, you go first and then I can add. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, I'm not sure um, just the details on why they're rerunning them. Um, yeah, I guess it's unclear without more detail. So they think they're getting false positives and so they're rerunning them to uh, confirm the false positive, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, without kind of driving in and figuring out what's causing the uh, false positive, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, what I can say is that, I mean, so we actually do, um, we talk very closely with um, the PACE that we work with, um, which was formerly Shealy Labs, and they mentioned that um, having to re-extract is one of the, um, you know, they want to stop having to do that. Right? It is something that's happening. Um, and I think that's honestly is where the edge could possibly add some benefit there, right? Because you are um, now automating it and making it much more efficient. So hopefully um, those concerns of false positives um, would be less of a concern. We can also run blanks on the edge. So you can make sure, you know, pre and um, post extract, you're not having any introduction of any more PFAS. And so hopefully you believe with, with what's in that sample a little bit more. So. The next question is for you, Alicia. What is the pore size for the Q-cup filter and what material is it made of? And actually, I had a question of my own. As long as you're talking about the Q-disc, could you expound on what different kind of Q-discs exist and a little, a little bit more information about Q-discs? Yeah. Definitely. Um, so the S1 that we used here is a specialty, um, actually S stands for sandwich, um, because it's a three actually filters together. It, and the center one is a glass fiber that filters down to 0.3 microns. That's essentially doing the filtration. So the glass fiber 0.3 micron filtration. Um, glass fiber, if anybody's worked with it, is not the most robust um, material. So we sandwich that into cellulose 40 micron filters. Um, so we keep the porosity very big for the cellulose, but they are really robust and keep that glass fiber filter together. Um, so that's our S1, which we have done all of the studies to ensure there's no PFAS introduced in that filter. Um, we have other filters available at CM. We have a wide range of cellulose filters um, from anywhere from two microns up to 40 microns. Um, we also have a um, few, few different membrane filters from nylon to PTFE, um, as well as some depth filters. Um, so, um, and we're always willing to work with a customer if they have a specific filter they have in mind that they really need to use, um, we can probably adapt that to work. Um, but we have, um, as I noted, um, probably about 12 different Q-discs available currently right now. Um, but the S1 is what we recommend for PFAS. Outstanding, thank you. The next question also is, is for you, Alicia. How much time is saved using the edge? So it's hard to draw a direct comparison on the time. As I noted, you are gonna be under 10 minutes per sample. Um, and But it does run in series, okay? So um, to run those, um, you know, all 12 samples, you're going to be in about, you know, under two hours um, time frame, which I think is still significantly faster than anything can be done in um, on the manual front. On the manual front, though, you, you know, you don't have to run one at a time. You can run more in a batch situation. So it depends on how much of a batch you're set up to be that direct comparison. But overall, the bottom line is you can run one sample. If you have a hot sample, you definitely had to look at. You can have literally have that shot on the um, LC um, in 10 minutes um, and have data in under 30 minutes. Um, and there's nothing else out there that could get you feedback that quickly. Right. Yeah, yeah. automation is always a good use. Go ahead, yeah, Craig. Jump in too, uh, in terms of saving time, um, you know, the automation will lead to a more reproducible, um, uh, more reproducible method, right? And so you're probably gonna save a lot of time by not re-extracting. Uh, samples due to potential human error. So uh, I think it will save a tremendous amount of time. Certainly rework, yeah. I think automation is always good for that. Alicia, you're getting a lot of questions today. Um, the next question is, what was the aggressive wash that you, you used to prevent carryover in your blank comparison? So I don't know if you're paying the details of um, when I put that slide up there. So it was a three-stage wash. So we did two washes of just straight methanol 
And um, with those two washes, we actually heated it as well for a little bit and held it for about 30 seconds. So we put the solvent in, brought it up to that 65 degrees C, held it for 30 seconds, then drained and repeated that. And then um, to kind of equilibrate the system back to the extraction solvent, we use the extract solvent for third wash so that we are ready to go for our next one. Um, so we did three wash cycles, which is, that's aggressive. Right? Um, there's some applications where you can get away with just one, um, but in this case, we wanted to very much make sure there was no PFAS hanging around. We certainly could development down and see if we could get away with um, a less aggressive wash, but certainly what we did worked. So I kind of have another question about that. The, you know, years ago, they used to have the automated solvent extractor and it was a high pressure extraction. I'm curious, how do you uh, what, can, what, go, what considerations go into the relationship between extraction temperature and solvent type? Yeah, um, that's a good point. And that's actually, um, you know, a lot of people that are doing extraction, um, maybe you're coming from the world of Soxlet, right? And so they have in their mind a certain temperature and solvent they need to run on, but they need to be worried about the boiling point of that Correct. solvent. Absolutely. Right. So you don't have to worry about that anymore once you're in that pressurized environment because we're always going to be at a low enough pressure or high enough pressure rather that we're not going to hit that boiling point. Okay. So really the range temperature range on the edge is um, anywhere from 30 to 200 degrees C. Oh, okay. And you can take very volatile solvents. So you can take, you know, DCM up to that 200 degrees C um, in the pressure range that we can run at. Um, so really the restraints are what's the best temperature for the analytes you're looking at, right? Because you can go hot, but sometimes hot's not always to your benefit if you're gonna start breaking down your analytes. Um, so with PFAS, um, we're keeping it pretty conservative at 65 degrees C. Um, we've actually had some, we're, we're doing some other work on like food samples as well um, and, and exploring kind of how hot can we go. Um, Cause I think it's still kind of unknown because we haven't really been applying heat to the PFAS world as of yet. Mm -hmm. uh, right, yeah. That's interesting. I definitely will want to talk to you about some of the other things I'm working on. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, the the attender, attendee wants to see the instrument conditions. And I'm not sure if that's the edge conditions or the mass spec conditions. So, um, Yeah, I, I would say if it is the mass spec conditions, you know, please send me an email. I'd be glad to forward those along or, or chat. Right. And that is Craig dot but at sciex.com or alicia dot stell at cem.com if you want next question is for alicia method astm 7968a is used yeah. for pfas and soil yeah. there is also no sb step involved in that method uh has edge method uh, results been compared to the astm method and if so how do they compare um, my guess is they would be comparable. I haven't done that direct study yet, um, but we have had um, customers that are demoing the instrumentation and so forth. Um, and so far, our recoveries have been comparable to anything that they were doing. Um, and so, but have I, in our labs, we have not run that ASTM method. I am do, you plan, do you plan to, or, or maybe we could do that with Craig? In yeah, conjunction exactly. with Craig. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that method comparability is always very important and that, that certainly helps uh, foster uh, acceptance of a new technique. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. All right. Uh, the next question is, can the edge system be adapted to low volume samples? Let's say you only got 200 to 500 microliters of sample. Definitely. So um, really where, where you're at is that you want to make sure just the sample stays in the cue cup, right? Because it's open on that bottom. It's just a filter. So if you were doing a low or volume, um, a liquid sample, you would want to support it on something. Um, so we actually have a product called Q-Matrix Hydra. It is a polymer super absorbent. We have also tested this for PFAS and there's no PFAS present. So it's not adding it, you know, it's not hindering the application at all and does a really good job of holding on to um, liquid samples. Um, so we have run actually up to um, 10 mils um, successfully on the edge. Um, uh, that's interesting. I have a question here for Craig. Many PFAS LCM, LC gradients start with 90% aqueous mobile phase. EPA methods call for 5% aqueous organic solvent uh, vehicle in the uh, auto sampler vial. Does the difference between these solvent systems present any analytical problems? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused by the 5% aqueous organic solvent. Um, I, th I think they mean 5% 
water in um, organic. Um, yeah, yeah, they wrote nine. Yeah, start with ninety percent aqueous with five percent organic. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, um, the concern can be when your when your starting conditions are at a very high uh, aqueous percentage, water percentage, um, and your injection plug will be a high percent organic. So you can have concerns um, with those analytes, particularly the more polar analytes sticking to the head of the column. Um, and sometimes you can get uh, some peak fronting, uh, certainly some uh, wide peaks. Now for the EPA methods, uh, the earlier ones, there, was con uh, there is a uh, requirement for symmetry. So then you would start to worry about um, failing those symmetry requirements. Uh, I would note that the, the new EPA method, in this case the water method 533, uh, has an 80% uh, methanol uh, and 20% and um, water. So that actually will help significantly. Uh, the second thing I would note is that um, uh, we found that using the Phenomenex Gemini column is, is very good uh, for peak shape, particularly with the early eluding uh, compounds. You can try that. Uh, the other thing that we have found is that moving to a slightly wider diameter uh, column, such as sort of like a three uh, millimeter diameter column, you get better mixing of that injection plug uh, with the starting mobile phase. Hmm. So, um, Yes, it is a concern, uh, but there are some techniques you can take to address um, that concern. Excellent. Uh, another question, this is for Alicia. Um, what range of soil mass is compatible with your extraction system? Um, that's a really good question. Um, we have extracted, so we do environmental samples um, on the you know, semi-volatile organic compounds side of things as well. Um, and there, um, a lot of those methods call up to 30 grams. Um, so we're able to do that with an additional amount of sodium sulfate. Um, really, so you know, I'd say up to 30 grams is usually what I say, but the capacity of the Q-cup really comes down to that, the outer band, right? Different soils are gonna pack differently. Um, and we kind of use that outer band of the Q-cup as our rule of thumb. As long as it's below that, you're good to go. Um, and so some samples, you can get quite a bit in there. So you brought up something interesting, sodium sulfate. <laughs> So is it common to use, I assume that's anhydrous sodium sulfate you're putting in, just yes. like a standard soil prep? Right. And is, do you use that for the PFAS extraction? We did not do it for the PFAS, but we did not explore um, wet soil samples. Um, mm -hmm. So if we were doing wet samples, um, it might be something that we would then consider. Uh, interesting, something interesting for sure. Another question, uh, uh, the uh, question is, you, the, the uh, question is, I assume the thermal degradation is not a concern. Either one of you want to talk about thermal degradation issues? Not at 65C that we're running at here. Um, so, yeah, and and I think um, the most labile compound in this case would 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 have been Gen X, um, and we we you know the recovery for that was excellent, right? And so, um, it does not seem to be a concern at this point. We have a couple more questions and only two more minutes, but I, I want to know, what, at what temperature do you guys think a PFAS might decarboxylate? Do, do they even do that? I don't know. They're, they're so stable. Uh, it's it kind of... Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, I mean, we, we do see some in-source fragmentation, um, you know, and we're running, we can run the sources, you know, six, 700 degrees, mm -hmm. um, but... It's, it's not significant, right? And that in-source fragmentation um, could be related to the uh, ion spray voltage. Sure. Yeah, rather than the So uh, not under the conditions that we run. Yeah, for sure. Two more questions. Uh, where do you get your PFAS calibration standards from? Um, so as we noted, we got um, two different ones. Um, Absolute Standards has one um, that is um, a DOD mix. Um, and then Wellington, I think, is the kind of premier, that's where people are going, um, standards right now. Um, so we have switched over. We're, we're primarily running Wellington standards now as well. Um, and our CRM we purchased from ERA, um, which is a company um, owned by Waters. Um, but also um, NIST um, offers a lot of um, CRMs as well. Yeah, and I would say uh, I've been working with Wellington standards since they developed their first PFAS standards, uh, you know, 15-ish years ago. 
And, you know, they've always had the most extensive uh, catalog of PFAS, uh, as well as the highest quality. So yeah. uh, for my money, Wellington is where I do. Wellington is the go-to. And our last question before we sign off, is the EDGE EPA approved? So there are currently no, you know, PFAS EPA methods for solid matrices out there. Um, the only two EPA methods um, are aqueous samples. Um, so we're hoping that yes, that's gonna be an answer down the road. And we're working with the EPA to kind of um, make sure that um, this, the EDGE system would be compatible with any suggested method um, that the EPA does come out with. Um, but as of right now, there are no EPA methods at all. So. Yeah, and I might note that in my experience with environmental methods, oftentimes, you're looking at a soil extraction. They're really looking at the data quality objectives to decide whether or not the data is acceptable. A little less caring about exactly how you mechanically did the extraction. So I think you have to be in pretty good shape there. Yes. All right, well, we're out of time. So I'd like to thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Craig. What an outstanding uh, presentation today was. Uh, and to our attendees, thank you for your time. We hope you found it informative. And again, if you have any questions, you can send your uh, question to Alicia or Craig, alicia.stell at cem.com or craig.butt at sciex.com. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Great. Thank you. Bye.